A warm welcome, Satya. So great to have you joining me for this Positive Leadership Podcast. Thank you so much, Jean-Philippe, for having me. It's such a pleasure. You know, you and I have been speaking and engaging a lot on a few of the topics we're going to talk about, and people, leadership, values, culture, transformation. But today is about having a more personal discussion with you, Satya, about those topics. Uh, so looking forward to have a great dialogue together. Absolutely. Yeah, so let me start you know, with your personal journey uh, and your childhood in India. I mean, you share some of those stories in your book, It Refresh, and some interviews as well, all the way back to your passion for cricket, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also, of course, the, the big influence, I think, of your parents, from your uh, dad as a civil servant and your mom as a Sanskrit scholar. How did they shape you, who you are as a leader today, Satya? Uh, it's a... Uh, it's a great question and i think uh i don't know i i wonder whether it is um tolstoy who said it but you know in some sense what shapes you is your own life right and the more you grow you realize that um and uh growing up in india jean philippe as you mentioned in the late 70s, uh, mid 70s, late 70s, early 80s, um, in uh, what is now, you know, what uh, in Hyderabad and Delhi, those are the two cities. It was a very different time and place, even in the context of India. I kind of look back and see uh, what those cities even are today, um, and especially yeah. Hyderabad. It's just a very different milieu. And to your point, my parents were massive. Uh, influences in my life and I look back I've lost both of them now and uh, and as I reflect on uh, their influence on me uh, just for example I, I'll never forget this my parents were just academically super well accomplished uh, but at the <laughs> same time uh, they gave me space in some sense to your yeah. point about my passion for cricket I mean I never dreamt of uh, for sure being CEO of a multinational <laughs> company. All I wanted to do was grow up in Hyderabad, live in Hyderabad, play for a bank and stay there. Uh, that was the, I was very provincial, quite honestly, in yeah. terms of uh, my ambition. But I think that uh, that curiosity my father had for ideas and new things and uh, breakthroughs and the calmness my mother had uh, of being present uh, somehow, the, somehow the combination, uh, yeah. I think, has had a significant, I would say, you know, influence in my approach in the ups and downs. All of us have the ups and downs, and the question really is, how do you navigate? But it's just a, it's been a, you know, it's a massive blessing. I think all of us are shaped by our childhood and parents, and uh, I was lucky enough uh, to have a life with parents who are loving and giving and, uh, in retrospect, a huge influence. And I can feel it, obviously, Sata, in your own interaction with people. I'm sure there's a lot of your dad and mom coming through that. And, you know, I'm not going to get into my own childhood as well. I will tell you, uh, maybe it's uh, same kind of passion. I had a passion for soccer, not cricket. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was when I was really 8, 10 years old, I thought one day I might become a professional soccer player. I never made it, by the way. So <laughs> maybe we have something in common. We missed, we missed uh, our, dream, <laughs> our dream jobs <laughs> earlier. Early on in your careers, but we found, <laughs> or we at least the life was kind enough to make sure that the, we found the right market fit. Let's say, <laughs> exactly. So you know, Satya, I, I remember actually really well your very first speech as a CEO uh, when you said something that really stuck with me. You said, "I want us to all the employees." By the way, all the employees were listening, watching, or some of them in arrangement. I want us to find meaning in our work. And you articulated at the time our new mission as a company, succeeding, of course, to our founder's mission. So why do you think it's so important for companies to have a purpose beyond only making profit and money, which is expected from, <laughs> from companies in the first place? Why is that so important? Yeah, I mean, there are two threads, uh, Jean-Philippe, for me in, in that entire uh, Piece. I mean, for the two of us who have grown up essentially through our entire professional career uh, at Microsoft, um, I felt that there was a reason why I stayed, you stayed. There was a, there was. I, I felt that Microsoft represented in its essence 
something that caused me to commit. I wanted to invoke that at scale. So in some sense, you know, it was just not by accident that whatever 25 years of my life had gone through and I was still at Microsoft. And so I said, why is that? And it is because of that sense of purpose and mission of the company that I identified with. Uh, yeah. I always, you know, we used to, you know, at least when I joined, uh, which was after you had joined, uh, <laughs> um, you know, we used to talk about our mission as a PC in every home and every desk. And yep. the reality is by even the end of the 90s, at least in the developed world, we had more or less achieved that mission. I felt we right. kind of kind of were a little lost and we went on this journey. What is our mission then? Uh, and then when as I reflected on it, the reality is it dawned on me that that was an audacious goal, right? When it was hmm. first uttered uh, in the oh, yeah. late 80s, in the early 90s, I'm sure it felt like, whoa, wait, will we ever get to that goal? That. But yeah. the reality is it was an audacious goal, but it was not the mission, the sense of purpose. In fact, I go back all the way to the founding of the company, and hmm. I feel like everything that needs to be known about Microsoft in 2021 can be found in the founding moment because the idea behind Microsoft and saying, oh, we'll create a basic interpreter for the Altair yeah. is <laughs> about helping others, empowering others to build more technology. And right. uh, so I wanted to invoke that in whatever reinvention I knew will come only if we invoke a sense of mission, purpose, and pride, uh, which got someone like me to stay in the company all those years. No, I mean, it's so profound, and I, I, I'm so much in the same belief, Satya, that uh, the true authentic mission that is something that our people can live every day can drive them to do amazing things. And, can, and I've witnessed that myself, like you, traveling the world physically for many years, digitally last, last 15 months. And just, uh, you know, one anecdote among many, and I knew you can relate to that. When I, when I witnessed what our team in India did just during the pandemic recently, and the way our people had this sense of mission, bring together, uh, obviously, their expertise or technology to enable the first line healthcare workers in India which was it so badly by COVID-19 to save a lot of lives. I can tell you the sense of pride they had helping belonging to their communities and helping their country was just so huge. It's one example among many where I can see how much a mission can mean to our people every day. And I think that so that's think another part which uh, I wanted to really make sure we were grounded in it on an everyday basis is that what is a multinational company? I mean, let's face it. Sometimes, you know, you can feel that a multinational company is a soulless company, right? You belong to no nation. Except, uh, to me, a multinational company that knows how to really invoke its mission, one community, one country at a time, to your example, yeah. is the company that I wanted to work for. And so that was... Uh, another, and I, the Microsoft I grew up in and I work in and I'm passionate about is that, right? Which is, it's not about the, the multinationalness. It's about the connection to every community in every country. And it's so powerful, as you said, because it brings energy to our people on the front line as much as it brings energy to people in Reitman all the time. So let me build on that first mission dialogue, Satya, and, and talk about another key, key driver, trigger, I think, of the transformation of our company. And honestly, of many companies we go to work with as a technology platform provider, I mean culture. And I think uh, one of my favorite quotes from you, let me read it, is you said our culture needs to be the microcosm of the world we opt to create outside the company. One where every individual can be their best self, where diversity is celebrated. So can you talk more about the way you felt culture was so critical to change or evolve at Microsoft and the lesson you learned along the way? Yeah, that's a, that's a, you know, in some sense, it's really the mission and the culture, and that's the entire ball game. Um, the way I have reflected again through out growing up here and thinking about organizations, what, why do some organizations try? Why don't they? Or when they get into trouble, what happens? I think it's really you lose your sense of purpose and identity and pride, or you no longer evolve your culture. 
uh, to essentially match both the expectations of all the constituents, your customers, your employees. And so one of the journeys I went on, Jean-Philippe, was what does it mean to continuously evolve? What does it mean to continuously learn? And let's face it, even the biggest issue we as human beings have is we all like to sort of talk about change, but not change, right? Because at some level, some of the joke is, you know, we want others to change, not ourselves. Uh, but the reality is the hard part of the culture that is needed for anyone to thrive, whether it is civilizations, societies, or individuals or companies, you need a culture that evolves. Um, and so when I went on that journey, I was really lucky after having read this uh, Carol Dweck's book, Mindset, maybe four or five mm. years before I became CEO. Yeah. In fact, my wife had introduced me to that book more mm. in the context of my children's education and child psychology. And then it dawned on me, Jean-Philippe, that <laughs> what is true for, say, two children, uh, two girls uh, in, a, you know, in a middle school, uh, one has more innate capability, the other has less innate capability, but we know how that yep. story goes. If one is a know-it-all and the other is a learn-it-all, the learn-it-all will exactly. always do better. And I said, yeah. oh, that applies to a CEO, but it also applies to the entire company. So I, taking that cultural meme of growth mindset, or more importantly, confronting one's fixed mindset as a daily exercise, is what allows us to, in some yeah. sense, be better at recognizing the importance of diversity. Because in 2021, what diversity and inclusion means and the bar for mm. it is very different than, let's say, 2020, right? If you're not keeping up, like if you go back and say, oh, I'm gonna think about well, diversity me. and inclusion like I thought about it a year ago, guess what? It's going to be impossible for you to succeed. Uh, even customer obsession, uh, or even how we as a company come together as one company. And so I feel that that everyday exercise of confronting one's fixed mindset uh, has been one of the bigger changes I think we have brought about to make the case for change. Yes. And, and Satya, I've seen so much of a positive impact and so much pain as well, to be honest for the entire organization, all of us, including myself, to learn and confront with our own, my own fixed mindset, which I've been. And one story, and I think it shows the power of that uh, cultural transformation, which I believe has been the key trigger of the change we made as a company. Of course, still more to be done, by the way, as you remind us every day at the SLT. You know, when it comes to my own experience, as you know, when I, when I, when I took this global sales leadership role, it was all about transforming the sales culture as well, <laughs> from a software company into a cloud-first, AI-first company. And what I, tr what I did intentionally was to take heads on uh, an iconic artifact of our old culture, the media review. So to explain to listeners <laughs> what it is, because <laughs> it, it is a very heavy, heavy, heavy corporate process we created as a company for decades, where we basically gathered hundreds of massive people in the room, locked in the room for seven weeks in a row to review every single data point of our business performance, everything else. And, and it was great, but guess what? Wow, we need a change. So I decided to kill it and give people time back, time back to spend with the customers, to, to stop being more customer obsessed. And the reaction I got really literally two months in my job, Satya, was so overwhelming positive. I received like hundreds of thousands of messages saying, it is such a good moment for us. Are we, and I, I understood the moment where I was just starting to address that cultural transformation, the sales culture of the company. So it's, it's a big deal. So Satya, just uh, adding to that, culture takes also a lot of qualities and skills from each one of us to change shape and also role model. You are known clearly, and I can see that myself as a leader with great empathy. And, and I think that you've been sharing as well openly how much you learn as well with your son Zain and his cerebral palsy and the way you, know, you your wife, your family, I've been really nurturing and really <laughs> leaving empathy every day. But I'd like you to, to basically bring that context into your professional life as well for the listeners. How do you connect the dots with empathy, but also work, innovation, success in your life, professional and personal life altogether? Yeah, in fact, 
you know, the word empathy, sometimes people associate with as, oh, that's some sort of a soft thing that is not related to business. Uh, or people say, oh, that's what I have for my friends and family, but I'm a much more uh, hardcore business professional. And the, the yeah. thing that dawned on me, though, is the most innate thing in us, it goes back even to the change and culture part, which is the most innate thing in us is that we learn through our life's experience every day to understand deeply more the people around us, whether it's our friends, our family, yes. or our co colleagues or customers. That's what life teaches you. If there's anything, every day you learn more about how to think about people and their thoughts and how to be able to relate to them. And that is, to me, design thinking, right? I mean, if you think about innovation, <laughs> right? Yeah. What does a company do? A company needs to meet unmet, unarticulated needs of customers. Needs. How is that insight? Where is that inspiration gonna come from? Uh, I think it's gonna come from that deep sense of empathy. You know, it may come for an engineer to actually have that stroke of insight when they see a log file of data uh, of saying, oh, wow, that was the customer journey. I should build a product for it. Or it's a salesperson who's listening behind, you know, beyond the words that are being uttered in a particular setting. Uh, so I felt that empathy is a beautiful word and let us give it the broadest meaning versus its narrow colloquial sort of meaning that sometimes we have. Um, and, and again, I feel it's at the center of what businesses have to do. Uh, of course, the beauty of both, I think, the growth mindset and words like empathy are, it also integrates. See, the other thing that I've always felt is we kind of say, oh, this is life, this is work. But, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, it just doesn't yeah. work that way, right? Our work yeah. is life, life is work, they're integrated, and the more we can do, even in language, mental thoughts and processes, where we're not trying to treat work as some transactional thing and life as something different, uh, where you're apologizing about one to the other, but integrate the two, I think it helps. It helps in many, many ways uh, in both innovation and success professionally, but also, uh, in being able to relate to people in uh, in and around your family. No, it is so true, Satya. And I would say, you know, you like me differently, obviously. All of us have different lives. I mean, I got to learn a lot as well and reflect, uh, you know, through my family journey as well, uh, the power of empathy and, and truly change my approach that I've been having myself as a more traditional leader who wanted to compartment my job from my family and the rest. And the reality it's not real, it's not authentic, it's not about you. And so clearly to me, you know, that empathy is about opening your mind first and be to be able to listen deeply and be keen to learn very different perspective from anyone you get to meet, as you said, and I've witnessed you doing a lot of that in many meetings internally and externally. It's also about staying out of judgment, which is so hard for all of us. Little voice, you know, saying, oh, this guy, that person, so, <laughs> so no, no judgment. Recognizing emotion as well from others and communicating your own emotion as appropriate at the right time as well, real time, and speaking the truth as well, whenever, when it might be uncomfortable, which I think is another aspect of leadership, which is not easy, <laughs> is to expose uh, issues, problems in a positive way with people. Uh, so building on that, maybe Satya, you know, you said success can cause people to unlearn the habits that made them successful in the first place. So what are the habits or leadership qualities that you work on to ensure that continued success? And what do you look for in your leaders at Microsoft? I mean, all the people we've been growing, nurturing, hiring every single day in a company. Uh, it's a great, you know, great question. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's sort of one of those things where every day, I know I've learned a ton, quite frankly, from you. And what does it mean to be a leader? And what does leadership excellence look like? Um, and the thing that I would say I've come to recognize is one, it's a privilege, right? Like you've got to start by saying the fact that you get to be a leader, it's sort of 
as it's a privilege and it's a state of mind, right? It's not like, oh, I need to be in a leadership position to be a leader. Uh, it's a, it's sort of an approach. And I would say there are three things yeah. uh, that at least come to me and that's something that we have tried to even build more muscle around at the company. One is leaders have this innate capability to come into difficult, ambiguous, uncertain circumstances and bring clarity, right? You never meet someone and say, oh, that person is a leader if they come into a situation where it's confusing and create more confusion, right? Leaders don't do that. Leaders create clarity. The second attribute of leaders is when you meet a leader, they create energy, right? And they, you know, and across the board, they create energy oh, yes. by not saying, oh, I am great, my team is great, and everybody else sucks. That's not leadership. <laughs> leadership no. is about creating energy across all constituents required in order to go after a mission. Um, the other thing, and the pandemic has been an amazing example, right? Uh, oh, yeah. If you think about even the example you used earlier in India hmm. or every country, quite frankly, if the pandemic was a tail yes. event, none of us could anticipate. Leadership is about being able to solve over constrained problems, right? I can't wait and drive success in spite of the constraints. That's leadership. Um, and you can't say, I'm going to wait for perfect sun and weather and, you know, conditions in order to do my best work. I mean, that doesn't happen. Uh, and so to me, bringing clarity, creating energy and driving success um, are really the three attributes of leadership. And, you know, I, I, I'll acknowledge that it's a high bar uh, for all of it us. Is. And every day it I is. like to sort of say, <laughs> shine the light on, how, did I bring clarity? Did I drive energy? Did I create success and unconstrain uh, the problem so that it can even be solved? And I think those are things that I think uh, at least I've come to recognize. And I come to recognize and leave those principles set every day as well, which is challenging, you know, sometimes. But I would say I would elevate one of them, uh, which is uh, energy, because, as you know, I'm trying to practice this positive leadership. <laughs> in, and, and one aspect of that is my belief is life is all about energy in the first place. And it starts with the people you meet who lift and increase your positive energy, as opposed to those uh, who are actually draining you. I, I was I was uh, inviting a guest, Dr. Audrey Tang, a psychologist, and she used this expression, emotional vampires, right? People who suck your positive energy of yourself and, and drain you. And so it's really important, I think, to, to recognize that. And also the professional projects that you decided to focus on that energize you and those that burn you out. Satya, let's talk now about really uh, not just the importance, of course, of empathy uh, as a leader, but also the, the way you've been navigating yourself at times of pandemic, this balancing act again between really empathy, taking care of others or team members, community customers, and driving hard <laughs> because expectations are high on Microsoft as a public company. How, do you, how did you make that balance work well for you as CEO of Microsoft? Uh, that's a fascinating uh, question, I'd say. that The thing that, that has been most helpful is the management framework that we started uh, just before the pandemic uh, that you were obviously very instrumental in helping us create, which was the model coach care uh, framework, right? I mean, I shudder to think even, Jean-Philippe, what it would have been like if we had not invested in yeah. what we felt was necessary for just good manager excellence, you know, model uh, modeling what excellence looks like, what coaching looks like. But quite frankly, that last element of care was hmm. a game changer, right? Because if you, in the pandemic, it became the entirety, right? If you had a leader or you had a manager who felt that they, or rather who understood what it means to care for their team, at, where, which because in some sense, we had this one big tail event but then within that tail event, every circumstance was different, yes. right? I mean, think about it, right? There were people with young children 
and their education disrupted. There were people with their parents who, you know, they had to take care of in trying circumstances. Uh, so a leader, a manager who understood uh, what it meant to provide that flexibility, care for their people, and yet at the same time move the mission and the project forward was, I felt, everything. So uh, I, I think that I'm so glad we started to put more focus on it, but becoming a good manager, uh, even for me, you know, this model coach care uh, as a framework, I think is just something that, again, requires everyday practice. No, I agree with you, Satya. I think what I've experienced myself, particularly with say, the first line manager, as you, as you know it, everything happens or ends at the first line of management in a company, whatever, whatever is the size of the company. And, uh, you know, uh, when I reflect myself, uh, actually, a few years back, I was trying myself very hard to transform our sales managers, as you may remember, across the world. And my team convinced me with a brilliant but quite intimidating idea where they said, Jean-Philippe, we'd like you to do a coaching, a live coaching session with just one of the best, one of the very best world's coaches called Michael Bungestani, a very well-known coach. <laughs> And so inviting me on a stage at Ready, which is our internal event, where I had thousands of managers basically looking at me. And I can tell you, it was a humbling experience showing rumbling, showing vulnerability and more in thousands of people. But the reaction I got after that moment on stage was, again, overwhelming positive. People felt that I liberated them by showing my own weaknesses, my own gaps, my own inability to address some of the coaching questions. And, and that got really us to embark on that coach model care framework in a much bigger way. So clearly to me, it was a powerful moment. And I believe we have still more work to do. But most leaders, I think, have to work on their first line managers every single day. Um, so, yeah, let's keep going, Satya, about the importance, again, you talk about importance of employee well-being over the last year. How do you yourself basically balance your professional life, personal life, with the level of responsibility in your hands, of course, both leading the company and the chairman of the company as well? So a lot of things on your shoulders, Satya. <laughs> yeah, it's a... It's another area that I think we're all uh, learning a lot. I mean, uh, one of the things uh, I feel very, very good about uh, is how, for example, even as we speak, you know, the Olympics are going on and uh, we've sort of hear about how people are talking about, you know, wellness and mental health uh, as just even for the most top elite athletes. Uh, as something that one needs to really pay attention to and even take somewhat individual responsibility uh, I, and, and for the society and companies to really give the space for people to be able to do that. I think it's a very important part, I think, of our evolution uh, as human beings and society. So I feel very good that finally we're talking about well-being. We're not just thinking about productivity in a very yes. narrow way, but we are talking about it inclusive of well-being. So if I had to practice that, one of the things that I feel uh, is to be a little data-driven, right? So to some degree, <laughs> using even uh, how you're using the most scarce resource we all have time uh, if you sort of think yeah. about the calendar and you really are about just completely scheduling your calendar uh, in ways where it doesn't give you the time to recharge to renew to be able to come back with sort of energy uh, so I think that you know those of us who have some privilege to do that we need to really exercise that. And then for those of yeah. us who are in the, have the privilege to lead people, we should ensure that we care about the well-being of the people we lead, uh, right? So in some sense, each one of us can do more uh, to recognize our own needs for well-being and the needs for well-being of the people we lead. Um, so one of the practices, at least, I am trying to do for my own personal self is 
Hmm. Being present, right? One of the things about work-life balance, sometimes it gets you to think, oh my God, do I have work-life balance? And it creates its own sense of anxiety, right? Because you're trying to balance something. Uh, but if you sort of say, well, at least the time I have with, say, my daughters or my dogs or my wife or my, my friends, my family, am I really present or am I somewhere else? Uh, and that everyday exercise, I think, has been a revelation. It does require real practice. Uh, it's like meditative. Uh, and so I think each of us will have to develop our own habits uh, but well-being is, I think, one of the things which we will talk of for many, many decades and years to come because it is, I think, core to what makes us tick as human beings. Yeah, I think it's, it is, again, a great, uh, I think, great learning as well. I show with you, Satya, and, and I think you, you, you made it perfectly right. I think, to me, it's, again, all about modeling as a manager or leader. And if you don't stop by taking care of yourself, <laughs> you're in trouble. You're in trouble with your people, your family, everyone else. So take care of yourself, both from a health standpoint, but also mental wellness, mindfulness, so that you can really bring in your mind every day when you wake up and engage in every moment of your life, that positive energy that you want to carry to the others you engage with in every single moment. I found that when I'm really witnessing myself <laughs> and showing that positive energy, it can make a big difference. That starts with me taking care of myself. So very good, uh, important reminder for us, Satya. One final question, if I may. You know, you are inspiring so many people, not just within Microsoft, outside the company, as you know. In particular, so many young leaders around the world. And on behalf of those young, passionate, purpose-driven entrepreneurs out there, I wanted to give the floor to a very special young social entrepreneur from my Leaf for Good Foundation. Her name is Mai, and she's going she's gonna to ask you a question. Mai, welcome. Bienvenue, Mai. Thank you, Jean-Philippe, and so nice to meet you, Satya. I am Mai, the co-founder of Gribouilly, a French learning community of 1,000 nannies, enabling social inclusion and employability. We strive to provide the best education in the early life of children and work-life balance for parents. I met Jean-Philippe at the very beginning of my social entrepreneurship journey when his foundation supported me. And it is a privilege to participate to the Positive Leadership Podcast today. And after listening to your amazing stories, Satya, I want to ask you, what advice would you offer to the listeners today that are early in their careers and eager to make an impact? First of all, Maya, it's so, it's so wonderful uh, to meet you and uh, hear about sort of your work, your foundation. Uh, it is, it's pretty inspiring. I'm actually, you know, very cognizant of the impact people, you know, in your profession have on early childhood and early childhood development and uh, how important an area it is. And so to me, if I had to sort of provide any advice at all, I, I think sometimes what happens to any of us is we so think about some achieving some objective, some goal professionally that we lose sight of what we are doing currently and the impact it can have, right? Uh, so I always say it's sort of slightly glib, but I like it because it's because don't wait for your next job to do your best work. Uh, try to define what you're doing in the broadest way. Uh, because it creates so much energy for yourself that then you create energy around it and in some sense it propels you forward towards your goal. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't have big, big dreams. You should. But at the same time, let us also be grounded in how important a job you're doing uh, today. And uh, I, 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 when I reflect back at my Microsoft career, that has been true. I, I felt the first job I had at Microsoft was as important as the CEO job. I never felt any different as a 24-year-old joining the company than I was, let's say, as a 46-year-old becoming CEO. It was exactly the same. I felt like, oh my God, this is the biggest job, greatest job I can have. 
Uh, and I think it was helpful. Uh, and uh, so I think what you're doing in your foundation and all those who are associated in your foundation clearly are having, going to have a broad impact, one child at a time, uh, in the most formative time of their life. And so, wow, what, a, what an amazing opportunity. And so therefore, uh, you know, that's kind of how at least I would approach it. Thank you so much, Satya. And let me, if you don't mind, just recap my own learning during this podcast. I'm trying to share with my listeners the key takeaways very quickly. You know, number one, I think, uh, as, as you said so many times, build a mission that becomes a platform for your people to derive meaning in their day-to-day -day work. <laughs> it's, it's so powerful. Number two, confront your fixed mindset every day. <laughs> number three, Really uh, develop empathy with your appetite to learn every day from every person you're going to meet in your life. Number four, leadership is a privilege and a state of mind. And as you bring clarity, you create positive energy and you drive success, I think you'll end up being a reasonable to more than decent leader. <laughs> Be present in your life and don't wait for your next job to have a positive impact on the world. I think that's a wonderful, inspiring discussion, Satya. Thank you so much for being a very special guest for me, as you can imagine, this podcast. And I'm sure listeners will share tons of feedback and, 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 and thank you again so much for everything you've done, but just with Microsoft, but outside as well. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Jean-Philippe. It was such a tremendous opportunity for you know, being able to join you and for your leadership and your inspiration. I've learned so much from you, as I said. Uh, it's been wonderful having this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you.